somebody in our community, his name is Kent Duick, um, was moved when he was 21 years old. Come on, come, on, come on up, Kent. When he was 21 years old, by the circumstances that he saw in our city, and he started Inner City Youth Alive. Let's give him a hand here. Now, just as I don't know everybody's name here, Kent doesn't know everybody's name here, so just say, Kent, my name is, and just say your name. You now know everybody. I got it. Kent, you were um, moved by the circumstances of our city when you were a young man. 21 years old. How many 21-year-olds have started something significant here? I want to encourage you, if you're 21 years old, to, to do great and daring things because uh, they have an impact on our city. But you were moved. What moved you when you looked at our city? What did you see when you looked at our city? Well, I guess somewhere, maybe somewhere, you know, one too many viewings of the cross and the switchblade, I don't know. There was this, this you know, That's movie. a really old yeah, movie for yeah. those of you who don't know. But I started to, <laughs> my, my sort of attention got turned to, to issues in the inner city. And, you know, I grew up on the hard, cold streets of Rolls-North, so it doesn't make a lot of sense. But, uh, <clears throat> but something stirred in me. And, and when I think about what it was that was stirring, it's, you know, we're talking about justice and righteous, righteousness and, and God's heart for people on the margins. It's in our DNA. Hmm. So when we are stirred for people that are hurting, it's because of a theological, it has a theological root. Uh, so I think that I, I saw within Scripture... God's heart for the marginalized, and, and then I, start, I started to get drawn towards doing something about that. Hmm. So when you started to get drawn towards, and you spent time in our North End, where you spent a lot of years now, what did you discover? Describe our North End for us. Well, for one, it's, uh, I mean, we often read about some of the bad things that have happened in the community, but it's, it's, a, it's a community that's rich with culture, and uh, we have lots of Filipino people, lots of indigenous people, uh, and, and lately, lots of newcomers. Mm. And so, uh, it's, it's like a small town, really. The North End, you know, you Rosenort? walk... Rosenort? Rosenort is a small town. And similarly, <laughs> I always call my walk from my desk to my truck the longest hundred meters. Because there's so many people in the neighborhood that just want to stop and talk. And mm. so, it's, it's really amazing. It's an amazing community. Also, huge challenges. Huge challenges. Like what? Uh, these days, you know, we read in the paper, you talk about meth, right? And, uh, and so it's, it, you just think of it as, okay, it's meth. But I see, it, I see whole families being impacted by this. Mm. And it's, uh, you know, I've seen this, this tangential sort of growth, like over time. And, and then all of a sudden introduce meth. And we're just seeing so many families hurting from this. Mm. And so, yeah, that's one of the big challenges. As you understand, you get to spend time with people who become your friends, people who you care about deeply, people who might have been in Unity Youth Alive when, when they were like children and involved in things, and now they're young men and women and facing really challenging circumstances. And uh, you told me a story about somebody who, who she moved you to, and you just spent time with her in her circumstances. Yeah. There's, there's one in the community that, um, you know, like I know a lot of people, and, uh, but I see, her on, I see her on a regular basis, and I could see that she was trying to be a good mom. She's a single mom. She's working hard, uh, and, and all of a sudden, through, through a turn of events, she called me on the weekend. She said, my kids have been apprehended. And so, um, so empathy uh, requires that you, you kind of go into the hole with people. So it's not that you sort of kind of call from on top and you offer sage wisdom and you should try this, you should try that. No, you actually go in there. And so uh, I sat with her and I listened to what this was meaning to her. And, and I could see as I was listening, I, I was, you know, you could just jump to action, but you really want to think through, you know, I'm, I'm kind of prayerful about, okay, God, what should I do here? So, so her kids were apprehended. Now, the last thing I would want to do is to advocate for her, get those kids back into a setting that's not safe. So I did lots of talking to neighbors and asked, you know, has anybody mm -hmm. noticed anything going on? Is anything, you know, and after I had done my, my sort of survey of the community, I said, all right, now I'm going to, I really want to press in. Uh, so I, list, I heard her. And so when you lose your kids, you lose your purpose, completely lose your purpose. When you lose your kids, you, you have a sense of powerlessness and you, you just have completely, you, you feel like you, 
you're not in control of your life. Suddenly, it's all been taken away from you. And, of course, in terms of your role in the community and your, your place, you, you lose that as well. Like, who am I now? And so, um, as, as I saw that and I, I listened to that, uh, I started to think about, okay, so you reflect on that and, and you know, I don't want to give the idea that I was just in some kind of, you know, monk, kind of a monk off reflecting. No, you kind of, you're, you're moving with people and then you're reflecting on, God, what do you want me to do? So it's a pretty active kind of reflection. But basically what, what happened was, uh, I, I said, it's time, to, it's time to speak up for her. And so that meant me talking with CFS and, and saying, you know, this doesn't square up. This doesn't, the community doesn't square with what you've heard and with what I've seen in terms of how she's... I would see her two or three times a week with her kids, and she's just a fantastic mom. I didn't see any of what, what was alleged. And, uh, but nevertheless, it, it meant me really stepping way out of my comfort zone. I'd go down to the, the office about, you know... Uh, once a week, twice a week, sometimes, and I would just, you know, I smile, and you can say a lot when you smile, but I'm like, I would say you guys are being really, really nice and friendly and welcoming, but you're not doing anything for this mom. And I would go, I'd knock on her door, check on her, her eyes would be swollen from tears, she's crying all the time, and I was worried that one day she wasn't going to be alive when I'd knock on that door. Mm. Yeah. So advocating meant, uh, meant being willing to kind of put myself out there and and uh, and and just really, you know, justice said this is this isn't right, yeah. this isn't right, and so that's that's where you know where I felt God was calling me to act. And just as you advocate for a person you know with a name, you've also realized that there are many people who you don't know, but but they are represented by huge patterns that you see right outside your door. And one of those patterns was absenteeism and kids who just weren't in school. And, and you said, okay, not only do I, do I enter into an individual woman's circumstances, I will take action on some systemic things, some problems in our city. And, and, and you took a action there. Tell us that story a little bit, because many of us may not know it. Yeah, um, I mean, back to that original story. The upshot on that is she's got her kids back now after mm. two years of advocating. And Sandy and I had her down for supper. And yeah. So, but again, uh, biblical justice is is about access to. And and so for for the last thirty two years, I've known in the North End. You see kids in the middle of the day; they're kind of doing their own thing. And I, you know, I talk to kids in the community about how many kids attend there are actually in class and, and we could just see that there was a problem. And so these, these kids didn't have access to what everyone else had access to, right? And so it was, uh, it was a couple of years ago, a friend of mine, Sal Burroughs, some of you know him, he's kind of like a pit bull of the North End, they call him, and myself uh, did a whistleblower with the media and, uh, and it, just, it just exploded. And, uh, and so it got me into some hot water. Not everybody loved me in that moment. Uh, but we needed to shine a light on something that wasn't right. And, and it wasn't just right from our perspective, but this was based on, again, that theology, that, that Old Testament theology about people should have access to those basics in life, right? And so that was driving me. And, uh, and so what came of that was uh, we were calling on a provincial task force to get started to address this issue of absenteeism. And uh, even though it was difficult, challenging, and there were a lot of angry people for us shining a light on this, um, we got it done. And we got a provincial task force launched. Uh, I've been on that, that task force for the full two years. And this last June, um, the provincial government committed to uh, millions of dollars to create this kind of communication uh, hub where people from employment income assistance, probations, uh, schools, community agencies, where they can ha kind of make sure that we don't lose those kids. Because we were doing the narrative sort of uh, look at the data and we could see that we were, the way it would always happen is at the end of the, the story, the kid would kind of disappear. The cum file would sit somewhere and now, where's the kid? Hmm. And so, as a result of advocating, we, we, we were able to move mountains. As you've done this, um, you're standing in a place where sometimes, what, when you're doing the right thing, it's still seen, um, you receive a hostile response. 
You're doing the right thing and you get a hostile response. Yes. Uh, one uh, high-ranking high person whose name I will not list told me that you're making my job really difficult. And I said, not nearly as difficult as it is for those kids that don't graduate because you're sitting on your hands. Hmm. And, uh, and so... <laughs> so, so, okay, uh, one, of the, one of the things about justice is that, it, that it's surprising, it has a surprising beginning often. Often it begins with anger. Now, not the kind of crazy social justice warrior anger that is really, you know, it, it's like uh, uh, do harm shrouded in virtue. That's kind of, Nietzsche described it that way. That's social justice. Do movement. harm shrouded in virtue. It looks nice, right? But it's actually not helpful. Hmm. And, and so uh, the importance of anger in the process of saying, you know, people, because there's this learned helplessness. So you can be in a situation where poverty is just kind of, you've got poverty brain and you can't see your way out. But then one moment, you say enough, and, and, and there's anger, and then from that, good things can happen. Um, brief story, uh, a woman in our community, we had had seven murders in one year within a block of our, of, of our, our ministry. And after the last murder, uh, the weekend prior to this uh, young woman, Janine Fontaine, beautiful young woman who was shot you know, I was there like literally when the fire was burning and, and probably 20 minutes after the incident. And, uh, and the weekend prior, there had been, there had been a drive-by shooting right on the block. And a woman whom after the, all these, the final murder there, we had a community meeting, a woman ran out of her house to the guy with the gun who was shooting at a house and started yelling at him. Hmm. And, and I'm like, so I asked her, I said, Pam, how did you get the courage to do that? And she said, I just had enough. And so it was just, it, you know, you get to the point where the injustice just rises and you're like, no more. It stops here. And, uh, and so it was her, you know, she was like, that was crazy. Yeah, she admitted that was nuts. I shouldn't have done that. But, but it started with that anger and then it, it kind of moved towards more thoughtful kind of planning to today where I talked with a neighbor about a month and a half ago and he said, things have completely changed on the block. It's because somebody got angry, and, and then we, we got organized, and we didn't agonize, we got organized, hmm. and we, we started to find a way to address some of these issues. So this whole process of, of understanding circumstances, these are people living in circumstances that they understand deeply, but joining them in solidarity and, and then taking action. How do we begin the story the, uh, the understanding the story. When it's not our neighborhood, these aren't our friends, this isn't necessarily our circumstances, but this is our city and these are our people. How do we begin the process of understanding? So um, there's a whole action reflection kind of a theory and I, I actually flip it and say reflection then action hmm. because um, there, there's something, um, I think of it as like active inertia where you can, you can see, yeah, Active inertia. Active inertia. So what it is Action is, reflection I get. Active yeah. inertia. So active inertia is, it's not like you're a deer in the headlights. It's like you see a problem and, and, you know, and do nothing and freeze. You see a problem and you fly at it. And so sometimes mm. we do things, it's kind of like, I, I refer to like a volunteerism, right? We see, hey, let's give cookies out in the north end. That'd be, let's knock on doors and give cookies. Maybe, maybe you should think that over. Is that the best idea, right? So it's a, it's a knee-jerk kind of reaction okay, to right. something we see. We want to do, we want to do well, and, and, but sometimes in our action, we haven't reflected enough. And so in, in all of the areas that we get involved, we're always reflecting and listening to the people. And so I think sometimes as, as a faith community, we can take third-world approaches to first-world problems. So we can provide like relief and just give stuff away. And it has sort of a cathartic feel for ourselves, but it may not be the best thing. So sometimes in that reflection and listening, it informs our action and then we act very differently. And it's, it has a deeper mm. eternal impact. One of the powerful things that I know has been true for you is your desire to help people tell their stories. Because as people are able to tell their stories, healing happens. But also as people hear stories, they begin a process of solidarity. 
Yeah. One of the uh, one of the awesome things that happened here in the meeting place was was had an intimate involvement was uh, we, we've initiated a story, what we call the story studio, and it's a recording space. It's uh, it's a state of the art recording studio, and and it's designed for people to come and tell their stories for the purpose of uh, healing, hmm. because other people are going to hear those stories, and and they're going to they're going to sort of pick up on the hope that's present within those stories, healing and the purpose of sort of uh, helping people to to realize what's possible. And so, yeah, the meeting place donated uh, two Christmases ago. You guys raised $25,000 towards that project. Mm -hmm. We did a soft launch in September, and we've had 70 different people take part in that program already. It's been so exciting. Mm. We've heard some. And, yeah. and it's actually uh, the person that runs that has is, is been very challenging because she's hearing these deep stories, and right. it's, it's, it's huge. Yeah. So this is your community. Week in and week out, you're here. Um, you got the microphone. Throw a challenge our way. Make it specific. What, what about us? Yeah, I think, uh, I know you're going to talk about something exciting that's coming up next weekend. Mm. Uh, but the, the thing of, of reconciliation, it, it's huge. Uh, I feel personally like never have we as a society needed what Indigenous people have to offer more than now. Mm. I, see, I see a grace within the community and a way, of, a way of relating to the world that we as, uh, we as a non-Indigenous community desperately need. And so I love that our church is starting to be thoughtful and reflective about our walking towards that, mm. that thing called reconciliation. So my challenge would be for us to continue to do that. Uh, the other challenge would be, can we refine our, our justice actions in ways that are even have a deeper sort of helping uh, or a deeper impact. Um, and then, you know, you just don't want to browbeat people. I find they don't like it. So uh, <laughs> I want to I wanna kind of make something accessible, right? Like, so we can talk about like this big, like, hey, why don't you start a provincial task force? That's ridiculous. It's, it's a, it takes work, right? But what can we do? What small things can we do with great love? And I really think that we underestimate the small things that we do that make a huge difference. And so my, my encouragement, you know, like I, I have to promote Inner City Youth Alive because that's the organization I work for. And, but I honestly don't believe in, in, oh man, I can't, I've never said this, John. I don't believe in it. <laughs> let, me, let me measure what I say. I, I actually believe in the simplicity of when there's a relational interaction with people, that's the power. Inner City Youth Alive exists, I think because as a, as a faith community, we have maybe lost some of our mandate around our, the importance of our relating to individuals mm. in a healing way. And so, yes, I believe in what we do. But my but challenge we shouldn't would be, need an organization to do it because the church should be doing it all the time, everywhere we are, in every relationship. Yes, and right. I, if you're bored, read the Child and Family Services Act. That's basically the <laughs> mandate of the church. Hmm. I'm like, ah, oh, they're doing it for us. Hmm. So I think, how can we step into situations where somebody needs somebody to walk with them in solidarity? And I, I, I know people are doing it. But how can we do that? And then how can we celebrate how huge that is when we do it? Thank you. Can I, can I pray for you? Yeah. yeah. Jesus, we ask that you would fill Kent and the many people that um, he has the joy of serving with and the many people that he has the the joy of getting to know, that you would fill him and you would fill them with the power of your Holy Spirit to truly work transformation and justice in our city. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. So Thanks, thank John. you. Thank you. Let's give him a hand.